Welcome to another edition of uh, an episode for my mini-series about Spiral Dynamics. In this episode, we're going to add on top of the six episodes that I already released, go see that mini-series on Spiral Dynamics. It starts with stage blue, to orange, to green, to yellow, to turquoise, and I might go back and add stage purple and red in the future. Uh, but we're going to be adding to that with a very important episode that's going to cover a lot of important nuances and uh, points that address and relate to the entire model as a whole and how to apply this model properly, which I didn't really have room to discuss in that long uh, mini-series because each one of those focused on individual colors. And here, uh, I need to say certain things about the whole model as a whole. Um, you might think you've heard everything there is to hear about Spiral Dynamics, but I promise you, you haven't until you've watched at least this episode. And we have a lot of material to cover here. This is going to be a multi-hour episode. So get ready. Very information-dense material here. So the reason that I felt this episode was necessary was because I see a lot of sloppy application of Spiral Dynamics. And that's very understandable because Spiral Dynamics is a very complicated and nuanced and rich model. And that's exactly what makes it so powerful is all of the nuance that's there, but it's precisely because it's now so complicated and nuanced that it takes so many hours to properly explain it to people and then to have them try to apply it and fail over and over until they learn the lessons. And then, you know, maybe after 20, 30, 40 hours of trying, studying this model, reading various books, listening to various videos and lectures, and then applying it in your own life and then seeing where you're making mistakes and getting corrections to all that, only then do you become really good at using this model and only then does it really reveal its full potential because it very much is possible to just sort of hear this model and then apply it willy-nilly uh, and then use it to judge people and to classify people and pigeonhole people and uh, not get the full fruit of it. So we're going to correct that today. And, it, you know, it, it's taken me a long a uh, while of study, you know, dozens of hours of study and application of this stuff to really start to understand the nuances of this model and how it gets misapplied, because I've certainly misapplied it myself. So first, I want to just show you the chart here that I made, which um, shows the entire model, shows all the colors. Now, I'm not going to rehash the same material that I covered in those six part uh, episodes. So, you know, I already covered blue and orange, and green, and yellow, and turquoise. Uh, those are the most important ones you got to worry about. And I'll probably cover purple and red in the future. Um, so you see the, the spiral here displayed for you. And basically what this shows us is that human individuals and societies develop uh, across the screen, from beige to coral. But also you see there's three other lines here that I want you to be aware of. And these are just additional ways of sort of slicing and dicing the same thing and talking about human development and the evolution of consciousness. But they can be important. So uh, here you see that timeline, the first one that says epics. And that one is archaic, magic, mythic, rational, postmodern, integral, mystical, and non-dual. So what do these labels really mean? Well, they, these are just additional vocabulary for understanding sort of the evolution of mankind. And you can think of mankind as having evolved through these sorts of stages. That can be useful. The reason I bring it up here is just so that you're aware of these terms, and I might be using these terms in the future in various episodes, just so you kind of understand what those words mean. And where those words now are situated uh, across the, the colors that you understand from spiral dynamics. So when I say rational, you understand that that falls into rather the sort of the uh, upper blue or the orange range. When we say postmodern, you know, that falls into the upper orange and green range and so on. Uh, the next two lines is the moral development line and the cognitive development line. And this is something we're going to talk a lot more about uh, later in this episode is lines of development. 
So here are two, some of the most important lines that there are, which is moral development and cognitive development. And these can be developed individually. So for example, you can have high cognitive development, but low moral development and vice versa. Moral development roughly breaks into four different phases. Egocentric, which is all about the self. Ethnocentric, which is all about my community. World-centric, which is concern about the world. And then cosmocentric, which is concern for the whole cosmos. Uh, and this, you can clearly see how one's circle of concern is expanding ever wider and wider with each of these stages. And then you have cognitive development. And uh, some of the words here, you don't need to know some of these terms like sensory motor. Sensory motor just basically refers to the basic cognitive development that a toddler or a child baby goes through. Then you have the emotional stage, which also toddlers and babies go through. Then you have CONOP, which stands for conventional operational. And then you have FORMOP, which is formal operational. And these come from uh, Piaget's um, work on human development. And then most adults stop their cognitive development at roughly formal operational, which is roughly the sort of rationalist uh, cognitive function. But then there's more. There's post-formal, which is sort of the postmodern. Then there's vision logic. And this is a very advanced form of thinking and reasoning, which really goes beyond visioning in, uh, beyond reasoning into vision and into higher states of in, intuitive understanding. And that's mostly what Actualize.org is an example of. All of my content, if you think that there's something unique about the way that I present material, uh, it's sort of beyond just your regular, ordinary, rational presentation of content. And it's even beyond postmodern. It's really vision logic. That's what Actualize.org is. I'm really good at that. I love that. Then beyond that, there's psychic, and beyond that, there's non-dual. So this just gives you a little bit of an idea of what we're talking about here. So now let's get into the, the meat of what I got to say. So firstly, to apply the model properly, you have to understand this notion of what I call the center of gravity of a stage. So what that means is when I say that such and such a person or such and such a country is at stage orange, what we really mean by that is not that that person or that country is at 100% orange and that they don't have any qualities of any of the other stages. Rather, what we mean is they're 50% orange, that's their center of gravity, and then 25% spills over into green, one stage above, and then 25% spills down into the lower stage from which it came, which in this case would be blue. So very few people or collective entities like corporations, groups, countries, religious groups are 100% any particular color. This is what makes this model a little bit messy. And this is why when you're trying to diagnose yourself or you're trying to apply this model to other people, you've probably found that, wait, wait a minute, Leo, it, it doesn't fit. Not everyone fits into these clear pigeonholes that you've painted. Not everyone's just a pure rationalist or a purely dogmatic fundamentalist or a pure postmodernist. And that's correct because you're moving up the spiral from this direction, from your, from your perspective. You're moving up the spiral this way. And as you're doing that, you know, your progress is incremental. So it's not that you're, you're just jumping by increments of 100% from stage to stage, but you're sort of like slowly inching your way up. So you should expect that you're not going to be 100% at any particular color. Uh, and this, of course, applies to societies as well. And in fact, it applies even more so to societies because a society has even more diverse elements in it than an individual. Of course, the individual psyche does have quite a bit of diversity and people are complex. We can't just boil them down to one single dimension or one single color. With societies, even more so, you know, societies have different regions, the north, the south, the east, the west. We have different subcultures and subgroups. We have cities and rural areas. Some parts of the country are more advanced than other parts. Um, some subcultures are more regressive. Others are more progressive. So, of course, within a society, you have to be careful in how you're applying this. So we might say something like the Middle East is roughly around stage blue. Uh, of course, but there's many parts within the Middle East. Some are more evolved, some are less evolved. So keep that in mind. Also, what you have to understand, very importantly, is that these stages 
stack on top of each other, which means that every stage is necessary in the same way that fifth grade stacks on top of fourth grade and the material you learn in fourth grade stacks and builds on top of the material you learn in third grade and so on. So it's not like you get to fifth grade and you throw away all the information and knowledge and wisdom that you learned in first grade and that then you you demonize and you ridicule and you judge first graders. No, because it's a progressive ladder that we're all climbing collectively together. And just because you're at fifth grade and somebody's at first grade doesn't mean the person's at first grade is somehow deficient or bad or wrong. You know, maybe you could criticize them if they've been stuck in first grade for 10 years. Okay, maybe then you have a legitimate point. But for most people who are just passing through first grade, you know, they have to pass through first grade to get to second grade to ultimately get to fifth grade where you're at. And you know what? Just because you're fifth grade doesn't make you uh, a hot shot because there are many grades above you. So keep that in mind. It's only by understanding the necessity of all these stages that you can stop demonizing and judging them. So perhaps one of the biggest mistakes that newbies make when they try to apply spiral dynamics is they think, like, well, Leo, now I'm at stage green and look at how bad stage orange is. Let me go criticizing stage orange and let me throw away all the lessons from stage orange. No, what it means to be at stage green is that stage green incorporates in it the lessons from stage orange and blue and red and purple and below. See? So acknowledge the necessity of the lower stages. Otherwise, you're going to create a shadow and uh, you're going to get stuck. Another way to look at it is that turquoise cannot be the only stage because nobody is born automatically into turquoise. Turquoise, getting up there, takes a lot of work. It takes decades to get there. You have to go through all the lessons and all the challenges and all the transformational dilemmas that come from all the lower stages before you can work your way up to turquoise. You'd be lucky if you ever get to turquoise in your life. Most human beings would be lucky. So the term is used transcend and include. When you evolve up a stage, you're transcending that particular stage. You transcend orange into green, but then you also include and bring orange with you. You bring the healthy elements of orange with you and you leave behind the pathological and dysfunctional elements the limiting elements of orange. So you transcend and include, not transcend and demonize, and not transcend and judge, not transcend and then uh, look down your nose at the other stages. Also understand that just because you yourself are, let's say, at stage green or yellow or one of these other high stages, that doesn't mean that everyone in the world can be. This is very important to understand. You need to be very cognizant of your own privilege and of basically the good luck that you received as a child growing up. Because look, you were born, if you're at stage green or yellow, chances are you are that way because you were born into a first world country that had a stable democracy, a good legal system, had a relatively peaceful uh, upbringing, you had a decent family that didn't abuse you, uh, you didn't have drug addicted parents and so forth, and you had a decent economic situation, and you were able to go to school, and you were able to finish 12 grades, and you were probably even able to go to college and university, and by virtue of this, by virtue of the development of your society, by virtue of the fact that your society already gave you access to the internet, computers, books, and uh, the greatest uh, philosophers and teachers in history in the form of, of our education system, you're standing on the shoulders of giants. And only because of that are you now, let's say, at stage green. So be careful not to then expect the rest of the world to already be there. This is a relatively recent development, stage green. And these various technologies and luxuries that you have, you know, they didn't even exist 100 years ago, even in modern first world countries. And most of the world does not have access to these resources. And even many people in your own country, like in, in Europe or in America, uh, the most developed countries 
in the world, even many people there still live in poverty and still don't have access to education. They didn't go to university because their parents couldn't afford to pay them, right? And so, of course, don't expect them to be at green. This explains why they're not at green. You need to acknowledge how lucky you were. It's really just a matter of chance that you weren't born in some remote village in Africa that didn't have any of these luxuries. And so, of course, now you're at stage like red, living in that village, maybe blue, but no higher than that, of course. So, you know, uh, you also have to give slack to these various underdeveloped countries and regions of the world because not all of us grow up together. So just because Northern Europe is more advanced or America is more advanced, you know, well, America and Northern Europe had certain advantages that other nations didn't have. It got really a head start. So some people like to criticize and demonize the Middle East or Africa or South America or other parts of the world like this in Asia, maybe um, for, you know, well, they're not as advanced as the European race, as the European countries. <laughs> That's just an accident. It's really just an accident. So, um, uh, you know, watch out. Maybe in the next lifetime, you'll be born into one of these uh, less developed regions of the world, and then you'll realize how difficult it is to evolve up to spiral. You have to understand that every child starts life from ground zero, basically from beige, and then you have to quickly evolve upwards. Now, society and culture are always evolving and inching their way up the spiral. And we've had several thousands of years of evolution, culturally. And this is a really positive thing, because if you were off on your own trying to figure all of this stuff, stuff out, out in the middle of the forest or the desert somewhere, you would be at the very lowest stages, beige and purple. The only reason that you're at orange or green or yellow is precisely because of how much society and your culture has helped you. Society has a pulling up effect, but also a pulling down effect. And this depends on the center of gravity of your society. So for example, let's say we take a person who's at stage red and we throw that person into a stage orange society. What's gonna happen is that the, the gravitational pull of the society is a few stages higher than the individual. So it's gonna be very easy for that individual to make progress, rapid progress up the spiral towards orange because all of the media he's gonna be exposed to, all of, the, all of his friends and all of his coworkers and everything he sees on TV and on the internet and all the books that he reads and all the schools he goes to, all of that will program him with the society's center of gravity, which is let's say orange in America. And so that person will quickly and rather effortlessly move up towards orange. Now, of course, it's not guaranteed. You can still stay stuck at red if you really want to. Uh, but most people will evolve up. But here's the downside of that, is that once that person gets to orange, now growth and development becomes a lot harder because to go beyond orange towards green or yellow or beyond, well, now the society is going to have the opposite effect. It's going to pull in the opposite direction because you're still exposed to all of the cultural programming and all the media and all that from your peers. And that's going to be all highly orange. So to evolve beyond the center of gravity or society, that's very rare. Probably less than five or 10% of the entire population will go much further beyond the center of gravity of their society and their culture because that now requires that you don't just sit back and coast your way to success or to development. Now you have to actually do the work independently. Now you have to go out there and find those rare teachers and sources and books, which are like the top cream of the crop of your culture and society, which usually, you know, you don't see advertised on TV or in mainstream media. Your friends aren't going to be supportive of your efforts. Your family is not going to understand what you're doing. And in fact, they're all going to do that sort of crabs in a bucket effect where they're going to try to pull you down to their level. And they're going to think you're a little bit nuts for trying to go beyond. And that's just how it always was. If you look at human history, that's exactly how it always was. The most advanced human beings have always had to struggle against the, 
the commoners and the giant mass of uh, lower consciousness people. And they had to drag and pull society up. And so that's what happens. And that's what we see all the wars and all the culture wars and all of the intellectual debates that go on. It's all about the few individuals who have seen the peaks of what human development and human society can be trying to pull the rest of the giant herd up the mountain, so to speak. But the herd doesn't want to go and it tries to pull them back down. And so that requires initiative and leadership on your part if you want to go beyond the center of gravity of your culture, your family, and your society. And that's, of course, where actualized.org comes in. And then, of course, if you want to go way beyond actualized.org, well, um, you know, good luck with that. You're going to find some other source that's beyond uh, me that will help you to, to go even further. Because, you know, at a certain point, if you evolve really, really uh, high, you will out-evolve me, and then the actualize of our content, if you keep watching it, it'll actually pull you down. Now, of course, I grow pretty quickly, so uh, I'm not standing still. I'm also growing the entire channel. So then the question is, who's going to be growing faster, me or you? That's up to you. I'll grow faster than most of you, but a few of you will outgrow me. And, of course, by no means don't let me limit you. And you will probably reach a point someday, a few of you will, where you outgrow Actualize.org. And that's fine. That's exactly how it should be, you know? You don't stay in first grade forever. You outgrow first grade. And you outgrow your first grade teacher and so forth. Now, there's an interesting catch-22 for raising the consciousness of mankind that uh, I've been thinking about lately. I want to share that with you. And that is as follows. Here's the catch-22. We start off as humanity, as a society, uh, at a relatively low level of consciousness. And then we want to develop higher. But we can't because most of the individuals comprising the society are all at low levels of development and consciousness. So... What we need to do to really help to elevate them up to higher levels is we need to evolve our culture and our society. But of course, we can't do that precisely because all of the people who are voting and making the decisions are all low consciousness people. And low consciousness people create a low conscious society. So we need high consciousness individuals to raise the level of society upwards. We need high consciousness leaders, but it's precisely because the level of our society is low that we don't have a lot of high consciousness leaders. See? And so this keeps us stuck. But also, you might now say, well, Leo, so then is it hopeless? It's not hopeless. It's just that it, it takes time and we have to inch ourselves up and we have to bootstrap ourselves. And that's what we've been doing for the last several thousand years as a species. And you know what? Actually, we've made a lot of progress. A lot of progress which you can easily see by comparing uh, an advanced country like America or some Scandinavian Northern European country with some remote village in Africa. You can see how different the levels of development are there. And uh, uh, that just kind of goes to show you how much growth is possible. And then you can kind of project forward and see how much more growth is possible that you can't even see yet. Societies don't even exist yet at the turquoise and yellow levels and beyond. So that will be very interesting as that develops, right? So uh, yes, it's a struggle. Raising consciousness is a struggle. It's a bootstrapping process. It's a sort of clawing your way up the mountain, up the cliff, uh, inch by inch by inch. It comes, it comes hard. It comes hard, especially when you're trying to go beyond the center of gravity of your culture. Uh, but it's precisely those people who are uh, bold enough and are willing to do the work of climbing up that sheer cliff. Um, they're the ones who end up pulling the rest of society upwards. And then your children and your grandchildren and your great-great-grandchildren, they will be able to take all of that for granted because it'll come to them easily because now they'll have books and they'll have internet videos and they'll have virtual reality and they'll have all this technology and all this stuff that we've built up, which is going to help propel them very quickly from birth to stage yellow and turquoise and beyond. It's just that most of us take this for granted. Most people who are born in a first world country 
they are already in an orange or in a green society and they just take it for granted. And then what they like to do is they like to demonize and criticize the third world countries, the blue and the, and the, and the reds and the purples for not being advanced enough, for being too religious and too fundamentalist and all this. Well, <laughs> look, you were just lucky. You were just lucky to be born where you were born and to go to the schools that you went to and to have all these advantages because you're standing on the shoulders of giants. Now, let's move on to talk about what the stages really represent. There's a couple of different ways of looking at it. First, each color stage represents density of ego. So red has a more dense ego than blue, than orange, than green, than yellow, than turquoise. So that's an expanding of what you're identifying with. And so basically, if you think of the void or formlessness, the, the I am, that true sense of I amness that you are, that enlightened self, that, that sense of formlessness within you is identifying with more and more form. So first it starts with just your physical body, then it expands beyond that to your tribe and to your nation, then beyond that to, to your, um, uh, maybe to your entire race and part of the world, then beyond that to the entire human species, and beyond that to include all animals and, and then everything in the entire cosmos, and then you know, ultimately at the very end you identify literally with everything in the universe. Because generally that's what consciousness is doing. Spiral dynamics is not just a human thing, really, it's just one particular case or example of evolution as a whole, and what the evolution of the universe is doing as a whole is it's developing more complexity, and it's expanding its sense of identification and consciousness. You can see it, for example, with the evolution of life, starting from little microbes all the way up to mammals and chimps and then humans, and then whatever comes after that, maybe artificial intelligence or something like that. Uh, the other way you can look at what these stages represent is they represent levels of cognitive development. And what that means is that it's how you think, it's how your mind works. Every color of stage represents a more sophisticated, nuanced, and complex way of thinking about reality and understanding reality. a way of thinking which builds on top of older ways of thinking. So it's sort of like you have the reptilian brain, then you have the evolution of the mammalian brain, which sits on top of the reptilian brain, and then in humans you have an additional layer, which is the, the frontal cortex, which sits on top of the mammalian brain. And uh, it doesn't stop there. There's, there's more levels to it, right? Then it's how you're using your neocortex. It's the software that's running it. And so it's sort of like you're upgrading your software from 1.0 to 2.0 to 3.0 and so on. And your cognitive development really determines your value system, which is what these stages represent as different values, and also the needs that you have, the quality of the needs that you're satisfying. So the reptilian brain, it's only concerned with the most basic needs. Maslow's hierarchy of needs of like sex and food and survival. But then once you satisfy those and you're moving beyond that and now your values include stuff that's beyond just basic necessities of survival and now include stuff like love and art and uh, self-actualization needs and, and then even self-transcendence needs and so forth. And then the third way of thinking of what these stages represent, and this here is critical. This is a huge insight. So pay attention. Each stage represents the ability to take on more perspective. More perspective. This is one of the keys to understanding how to climb the spiral quickly. It's about taking on more points of view beyond your limited personal egoic perspective, which is sort of where you start life with. Uh, I talk a lot about perspective, and um, I try to introduce you to lots of different kinds of perspectives. And this is just something that's been a strength of mine for my entire life. I've always been good at this. And that's one of the things that I bring with Actualize.org is that I, I can bring you to higher perspectives. I'm really good at that. 
Um, and I didn't realize this until recently that that's what Spiral Dynamics is about. It's about being able to explore new perspectives and being open-minded to new perspectives. And so the thing that keeps people stuck at their level and not evolving is that they get stuck in one perspective or another. Now, a mistake that many people who are good at dealing with different perspectives and looking at the world through different lenses, you know, if you're like me and you're good at doing that, you tend to assume that, well, everybody can do this, right? It's like, it's not rocket science to see, for example, that if I'm a Christian, then that's just one perspective. And then, you know, if I'm a Muslim, that's another perspective. And the Buddhists have their own perspective. And so every religion is just like a different perspective. It's not rocket science. Everyone can do that, right? No, not at all. The majority of mankind at where we are today in the 21st century is incapable of doing this. Looking at the world from multiple perspectives and being able to be mentally and cognitively flexible enough to jump and abandon your own perspective and look at different points of view, that's like a skill. Think of it like trigonometry. That's a skill you had to learn. Now, maybe some people are more adept at trigonometry than others, but you still have to learn it. You don't really start off with that ability. Uh, and so most of the world doesn't know how to do this, especially stage blue and below. They're very poor at being able to see from any point of view beyond their own. In fact, they don't even acknowledge the existence of perspective or the importance of perspective. There's no such thing to these people. To these people, there's just like reality and just like the truth. And whatever my perspective is, that is the truth. That is reality. So you got to understand this to understand why people get so dogmatic and so stuck and closed-minded, especially at stages like blue or orange or even green. These people are not able to go to higher and higher perspectives. So for example, don't be surprised that stage blue people are fundamentalist religious and can't see the interconnectedness of all the different religions in the world and all the different cultures. And that stage blue, you know, it's very ethnocentric and therefore it can be quite racist. Don't be surprised by that. A lot of people are kind of surprised by racism as though it's this disgusting thing like, how dare these people still act racist in the 21st century? No, you don't understand. The majority of the entire population in the world is at a stage of cognitive development where they are supposed to be racist. This is not a mistake. This is something that still needs to be worked out. Stage blue can't help but be racist. This isn't a demonization of them. This is just how that mind works at that level of development. You were that way. Your ancestors were that way at one point. Um, and, you know, if not for, for a lucky coincidence, you would have been born a part of the world where you would have been at stage blue and you would have been racist and it would have been considered totally normal. Nothing wrong with it at all. Now, of course, I'm not saying this to justify racism. I'm just uh, explaining to you that, you know, you got to stop taking modern developments for granted. The shedding of racist perspectives is a very modern development, which has happened like in the last 50 to 100 years in the most advanced countries on the planet to maybe like 10% of the global population. All right, got to understand that, got to appreciate that. That explains a lot of the stuff that's going on in the world today. Um, so don't be surprised when Stage Blue, for example, turn spirituality and mysticism into religious fundamentalism and dogma or goes to war over these various spiritual ideas. Don't be surprised by that because that's their level of cognitive development. So what do I mean really when I say that each perspective or rather each stage is the ability to see more perspectives? So here's what I mean. So let's start with stage blue. Stage blue is the ability to see from the perspective of your civilization and your culture 
and defending that and working towards it, which is a great evolutionary step because before that, people were very, very egocentric. So this is an evolution to ethnocentric. But the stage blue person is unable to step outside of the perspective of his culture, his race, his ethnicity, his religion. So it's like just it doesn't compute for the mind, right? The mind can't do this. The mind like needs a software upgrade to be able to move to orange. And at orange now, orange becomes a little bit less ethnocentric, more world centric. Now orange can start to see that, wait a minute, my civilization, my culture is not the best one. There's various other kinds out there. And now orange moves into sort of the rational perspective. Everything is rational and scientific. But orange still is not able to take higher perspectives. Orange now becomes stuck within rationalism and within science. And now Orange thinks that science and rationalism is the most true, the best perspective. It's objective. It's factual. Well, that turns out to be an illusion. And if you go beyond that, you can evolve to green, which requires that you take an additional level of perspective and you see that, oh, wait a minute, science and rationality, that was just one perspective out of many others. And that moves you into postmodern. Uh, but then at that point, you start to think that, well, now I've, I've gotten to the end. Now I'm at the highest level of perspective taking that's possible. Because Leo, now I acknowledge all perspectives. Look, uh, uh, I'm okay with different religions and different cultures. In fact, I value, I'm multicultural. I value different perspectives. I, I want to hear from different cultures. I don't want to oppress any cultures. And I want to fight for human rights and equality and justice for everybody. But what you're missing there is that that itself is also just one perspective out of many others, and it's not the best. And there's no normative reason for why everyone should be at that level. And when you understand that, then you move up to yellow. And at yellow, now for the first time, you're able to see the full spiral. You're able to see that people are at different levels of development. You're able to understand that all of these levels have certain need and serve a certain function in the same way that different levels within a skyscraper are all necessary to make up the whole skyscraper. You can't just get rid of the, the third floor in a skyscraper because all the other above, uh, above floors depend on the third floor. Um, and so yellow takes the perspective that all of reality is a matter of perspectives and that all perspectives are partial and that we need to integrate various perspectives together and make sense of them all and be holistic. And that's great. Uh, that's a huge leap beyond all the other colors that came before. But then there's a, even an additional level of higher perspective you can take, which is that past yellow into turquoise, now you start to transcend the perspective of a human being. And now you st start to take on mystical perspectives and uh, cosmic perspectives, which are no longer rational, no longer human even, and really transcend even the idea of perspective. Ultimately, you get to non-duality, and at non-duality, you're sort of in the non-perspective perspective, which is you're at the absolute, which is how reality looks when you're not looking at it from any particular point of view. See? So, so keep that in mind. If you want to evolve up the spiral very quickly, you got to get very good at dropping your old perspectives and taking on new perspectives. And this is not easy to do. Looking at the world from a new perspective is difficult. It's challenging for the mind. It's taxing for the mind to see a problem in a new creative way. That's what new perspectives amount to. But you can train yourself to get good at this. So by no means am I condemning the rest of the world by saying that, well, they're just stuck and they can't take more perspectives. They certainly can. They can be taught to, but they need to be taught, which requires work and time and effort. Like if we spend billions of dollars creating all the right books and the videos and the teachings and the courses in the universities in Africa that are necessary, then we will quickly grow Africa into 
uh, higher developmental stages. But of course, we aren't doing that. Not nearly enough, which is why the rest of the world is not uh, developing as quickly as we'd like them to. You know, if you want a solution to the world's greatest evils like terrorism and Nazism and racism and slavery and uh, corruption and mafia and uh, criminal gangs and uh, online syndicates, you know, criminal syndicates that steal credit cards. And so if you want to solve that problem, what you need to do uh, is that the first world countries need to pool their money together to help to raise the third world countries to higher stages up the spiral to at least blue or orange. And then most of that stuff would just automatically stop. Because that behavior only comes from people who are at stage uh, red or low blue on the spiral. You won't get that, those kinds of behaviors from orange or from, from green people. As society evolves, survival needs change. And that's another way to look at spiral dynamics. What spiral dynamic stages are, they're responses to various kinds of survival needs. But look at how this works. Like if, uh, if an animal is living in the forest, it has certain survival needs. If an animal is living in the desert, it has a different set of survival needs. If it's living in the tundra, in the wilderness, in the Arctic, it has a different set of survival needs. Each set of survival needs corresponds to the particular environment that it needs to survive in. But look what happens with mankind. Mankind shapes and creates its own environment, which adds a very interesting extra layer of depth to this whole um, survival needs issue. Because mankind doesn't survive in a forest for the most part, or in a desert, or in the tundra. We survive within the society and culture that we create. Most of our society is collective. So think of it as like, we are like ants building an ant colony, or we're like termites building this giant termite colony. So we are creating literally our own environment. We are terraforming the planet around us to suit ourselves. But as we do that, uh, we then become our own greatest enemies because it's our ch changing social climate and all the changing technological advances that are happening, the cities that we're building and so forth, that now creates new sets of survival needs. Now it's no longer about who has the biggest muscles and who can physically dominate nearby tribes. We have outgrown that. Now it's about how capable are you at socializing and schmoozing and playing politics. That's what you need to ascend and to survive within modern society. How good are you at using technology? If you're a good... Um, uh, tech user to the point where, let's say you can be a programmer, you know, programming gets paid very well by society. So if you want to survive in, in modern times, become a programmer. It becomes very easy to survive and to feed yourself and to feed your family because our social environment, the structure of our ant colony has gotten to the point where we need a lot of programmers because we have a lot of computers and computers are very powerful at shifting information. We're in the information age. See? And then, you know, in a hundred years or a thousand years, it'll be something else. It won't be programmers. We'll need somebody else. And all the programmers, they'll go hungry and broke. So, um, so you got to understand that, you know, as our society changes, what you need to survive within that society changes. Certain things become less important. Certain things become more important. Like having big muscles is not important these days. Knowing how to use your mind, though, that's very important. That's very powerful. Knowing how to use your mind properly can earn you millions and billions of dollars. Knowing the right skill sets, how to program, how to socialize, how to network with people, these sorts of soft skills, as you might think of them, are way more important than the hard skills of like being a lumberjack, cutting down a tree, or um, being able to drive a bulldozer or something like that. These are much higher value.
than, than those old kind of skills because we don't need them as much. So mankind is in a process of bootstrapping itself. And ultimately, what's happening within our society, what our society, the environment that we're creating with our society, our ant colony, our ant colony is making it easier and easier for more people to be more conscious. Today, in the 21st century, we have access to books and videos and resources and institutions and education that can quickly get you to stage green and beyond. And so ultimately, we're engineering, and this is all happening spontaneously. Nobody is masterminding this. No individual human really even understands that this is happening, is that this ant colony is sort of naturally evolving to the point where in the future, in a thousand years, most kids who will be born, they will be quickly transitioned into stage turquoise and beyond. And they will have very high levels of consciousness very quickly because their ant colony will have been designed by thousands of years of evolution and struggle and hard work to make that just effortless and easy. In the same way that, you know, today, if you grow up in a first world country, you're going to be literate. 99% of people in America who are born today are going to be literate. It wasn't like that 300 years ago. It's not like that in many other places in the world. You know, in Africa, I don't know what the percentages are, but they're low. In certain parts of Africa, there will be less than 50% of kids who are literate, who even are able to go to school because there are no schools or because the, the area is so dangerous that just going to school is a, is a risky affair. See, likewise, you know, in the future, enlightenment will be very easy for people because you'll be just told about it from the very, very beginning. From first grade, you will already hear about it. From kindergarten. Um, and it won't seem weird or woo-woo or new age or any of this sort of stuff. It'll just be easy. Your parents will already be enlightened. All your friends will be enlightened. Your teachers will be enlightened. So, of course, you'll get enlightened super easy. But uh, not in our lifetime. That'll take some number of hundreds of years to get there. Maybe thousands of years. So, uh, I just want you to understand what's happening at the very big picture level. At the big picture level, consciousness is bootstrapping itself and it's building the infrastructure that it needs to facilitate more consciousness. That's pretty cool. A common mistake that people make, especially stage green people, is they like to romanticize early phases of human society. The hunter-gatherers that lived before the agrarian age. And they were the spiritual ones. They were the peaceful ones. They didn't have this toxic masculinity. They didn't start any wars. They didn't have any nuclear weapons. They, uh, you know, they were just peaceful and simple people. And then, and then it's when agriculture came along, that's when everything um, became violent. And then there were war and military and conquests and dictators and tyrants and all of this. And ever since mankind has been going downhill. That's not a correct view. Because if you actually go and you study these hunter-gatherer tribes who still exist in certain parts of the world, in South America, in uh, Papua New Guinea, in Indonesia, and in, uh, Africa, in certain areas, uh, what you see with these tribal people is that in a certain sense, yes, they are peaceful. And in a certain sense, yes, they are spiritual. But really, the majority of them are at stage purple, which is very low. This makes them superstitious. They're highly uneducated. They're not able to reason properly. Their scientific understanding of the world is very limited. These people are also very racist and bigoted. They're closed-minded. They're not open-minded people. They're not open to all sorts of worldly cosmopolitan perspectives because that takes development. These people have slavery. Hunter-gatherer tribes all around the world, through all of human history, had slavery, and it was perfectly acceptable. Slavery was only abolished around stage orange. They also engage in tribal warfare, where each tribe, although it might be peaceful and spiritual with itself, with its own members, it will uh, fight to the death over very silly matters, 
with neighboring tribes. Like a neighboring tribe could steal a pig and then they'll go to war for decades. Clan warfare. That stuff still goes on in the Middle East. Clan warfare. Very tribal culture because a lot of the Middle East is still stuck in purple. They have no legal system. So it's hard to get justice. They don't really have any corporations or businesses. They don't really have a, a solid economic system. It's difficult to, to make transactions because everything has to be bartered and traded. There's no currency. Or if there is, it can be easily manipulated and exploited. These tribes, they rape and they pillage. And also what you have to understand is that in a certain sense, it's easy for these tribes because they're still at a very low scale. They're not at mass scale. We're only talking about hundreds, maybe thousands of individuals in one of these hunter-gatherer tribes. But what people don't understand is the kind of stuff that is easy and that works, the solutions that work, the structure, the infrastructure that works at low scales of humans does not scale up without huge problems when you start talking about hundreds of thousands and millions of people. What happens when you take 10 million people and you put them into a densely packed area together? How do you make sure that they don't rape, thieve, and slit each other's throats? That's a real challenge, a real challenge. And what happens when you throw technology, advanced technology into the mix? What happens when you throw rocket launchers into the mix and automatic weapons, landmines, uh, pollution, waste, gas, uh, and nuclear weapons? How do you make sure that those people don't all kill each other? Well, that's a real challenge. And that's what society has been coping with. And it was gradually evolving itself to deal with these challenges and to scale up. So even though these hunter-gatherer tribes might seem like they have it all figured out and they live peacefully with nature, that's only because they're doing it at a low scale. That's easy. That's easy. It's easy to get 10 people to live in harmony together. Uh, try doing it with 10 million. Try doing it with 10 billion. When you start to have so many people that there's actually a strain on the resources of your environment, like for example, on Easter Island, these hunter-gatherers lived on Easter Island, but then they ended up uh, chopping down all the trees and uh, over farming the entire land to the point where they couldn't sustain themselves on that island and they all died out. That's precisely what happens and that what that's what could happen with the entire globe if we're not careful. So what needs to happen is that we need to keep evolving forward to solve these problems. And in a sense, because we're building our own environment, our own um, ant colony, we are our own greatest enemies. So we have to be cognizant of uh, what kind of ant colony are we building. But in the end, no one person is in control. There is an intelligence that's guiding this entire process that you can sort of have faith in. You know, mankind has solved a lot of problems over the last 5,000 years. So you can probably expect that we'll solve a lot more in the next few thousand years, at least if you want to be hopeful and optimistic because no one is running the show. No one individual is smart enough. No dictator, no businessman, no uh, Elon Musk figure is going to be smart enough to solve all of these problems for us. It's going to be solved by the collective intelligence of all of mankind and really all of the entire force of evolution. The force that's responsible for designing your body and all of these cells that are working together, trillions of cells all working together, create this organism here. Um, that force is going to be responsible for creating the optimal society to help elevate the consciousness of all of mankind and ultimately the entire universe. Now, uh, let's move on to the next topic, which is a super important topic, so pay attention here. And this is the distinction between stages, states, types, and lines of development. And this is an idea, a brilliant idea that I got from Ken Wilber, who's a, really a, a visionary thinker when it comes to, to these topics. 
So with spiral dynamics, the different color stages, those are what we call stages of development. That's good, but that doesn't explain everything. On top of that, we have an additional layer that we need to add in of complexity called states. So the stages are purple, red, blue, orange, green, yellow, turquoise. The states are waking, dreaming, deep sleep, various mystical states, various non-dual states, psychedelic states, meditative states, emotional states. So when you're asleep tonight, that's going to be the dreaming state. And then when you wake up, that's going to be the waking state. And then there's going to be a mystical state that you might achieve on some psychedelic and so forth. When you are in a, you know, something terrible happens to you, like you get a divorce or something, or a loved one dies, now you're in a terrible, depressed, emotional state. So what you got to understand about these stages and states and types and lines, which I'll cover in a second, is that these are independent axes so, for example, you can be at stage orange, waking, dreaming, deep sleep, or in a mystical experience, in a meditative state, or in a state of depression, or in a state of excitement and, and inspiration, but you're still at an orange level of development along all that changes in states. So, this gives a lot more complexity and nuance to biodynamics. A lot of people mistake states for stages. Like they might be meditating and they might be some in some meditative peak state where they feel like they're one with the universe. But then when they stop doing that, they come back and they're just at an orange level of development. They're still pursuing money and sex and food and just like basic orange type stuff, and they're working on their business. That's very different from a stage turquoise, because a stage turquoise might have locked in that peak meditative state to something that is like there all the time for that stage turquoise person. It's also very important that you understand that mystical states are possible at any stage. So, again, this, this confuses a lot of people because people think that, well, Leo, so I will get enlightened when I get to stage turquoise, that's not really how it works. How it works is that you can have an enlightenment experience at any stage. You're never limited. That's why enlightenment is always available to you. You don't need to be at a particular level of development. Stage blue people can have a mystical state. Stage green people, yellow people, turquoise people. Now, of course, the higher your level of cognitive development, the easier it will be for you to have a mystical state because you're not going to be so preoccupied with uh, low-level concerns like survival needs. You're much more likely to be interested in meditation if you're at stage green or yellow than if you're at red or blue. But nevertheless, for example, uh, many blue religious people have genuine mystical states the problem, though, is that your mystical state, whatever stage you have it at, will be interpreted through the lens of the stage that you're at. So when a blue fundamentalist Islamic person has a mystical experience, he's going to interpret that in a very limited ethnocentric way of like, oh, I experienced Allah, for example. And that proves that Islam is the greatest religion and that all the other ones are false. Buddhism is false. Christianity is false. Now I know for sure they're false because I had this mystical experience. And likewise, for example, when a stage blue evangelical has his mystical experience and he sees Christ, the vision of Christ comes to him. And that validates in his mind that Christianity and Christ is the one true prophet and savior and that all others are false and there's nothing to learn from Buddhism or from Islam or from anybody else. All those people are obviously wrong. And see, in this way, it's possible to have genuine mystical experiences, but then still to interpret them through a very limited level of cognitive development. Because Look how it works. Yes, it's true that the absolute is one and it doesn't change and it doesn't really evolve. 
if you have a mystical experience of absolute truth or awakening or enlightenment, and that's, by the way, not the only kind of mystical state you can have. There are lesser mystical states. You can have all sorts of visions of deities and all sorts of stuff. Uh, but if let's say you're at stage blue and you do have a pure experience of, of the absolute. Well, yeah, when you're in that frame of mind, that absolute is the same no matter what stage you're at. It doesn't matter if you're blue, orange, green, or anything. And in that sense, it doesn't matter. In that sense, you could say you had a genuine enlightenment and it doesn't matter what color stage you were at. But of course, in practice, it does matter because then you're back into your everyday life and you're in the relative domain of forms. Yes, the formless is the same. It's nothingness, it's emptiness, it's void, it's always the absolute. But then form, form changes and how you interact with form, how you live in the dream, that very much depends on your level of development. And also how you interpret the formless and how you embody it in the formed realm, that of course very much depends on your level of cognitive development, your ability to take perspectives. So it's very important that you make this distinction between awakening to the absolute on the one hand and development on the other hand. These are independent things. Now, there is some correlation so the more developed you are, the more likely you are to awaken, the more likely you are to be interested in awakening, and vice versa. The more awake you are, the more likely you are to be developed and to be interested in development, but they're not perfectly correlated. And it's very easy to awaken, for example, but then stay stuck in stage blue. It's also very easy to evolve to stage yellow or even turquoise, but never fully deeply awaken. And you really want both. What I'm pushing for with my content with Actualize.org, what I really advise for you is to pursue both. Awakening is about waking up from the dream, realizing that none of this is real. It's all a hallucination. That's very important because that detaches you from the dream. You stop taking it so seriously. But you're still going to be in the dream. So long as you're alive, you're still going to be in the dream. And as long as you're in the dream, you might as well play the dream out well, excellently. Develop yourself within the dream. Development is about being able to play within the dream in an excellent manner. In a sort of more integrated, more holistic manner to understand more of the dream, to appreciate more of the dream, to explore more of the dream. So you can be awake, but you know, just because you're awake, the dream doesn't end. It keeps rolling al along no matter what. So no matter what choice you make, the dream will keep unfolding until you're dead, physically dead. So it makes sense that if the dream is going to unfold no matter what, you might as well try to play the dream out to be the best dream that it can be. So both. Now, that was an explanation of states and stages. Now, also, we got to add an additional layer, types. Types are things like masculine versus feminine, the various Myers-Briggs personality types, there's 16 of them, the Enneagram types, there's nine of them, or if you're a left-brained person or more of a right-brained person, that's two types right there, and perhaps there are other types as well, but those are the most common ones that I uh, have studied. So, what types mean is that, for example, you can be at stage orange, obviously, and you can be a masculine stage orange, or you could be a feminine stage orange. Or you can be one Myers-Briggs type, like an INTP, which is what I am, at, let's say, stage yellow. Or you can be an INTP at stage red. A common mistake that people make is they think, that, well, Leo, but like, Stage green, that's the feminine stage. Stage orange, that's the masculine stage. And like INTPs, those are the yellow people. And then some other Myers-Briggs thing uh, type is like a red person. No, 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 no. You can be masculine or feminine at every 
color of the spiral. Every Myers-Briggs type can exist at every color stage. Every Enneagram type as well. Uh, so that adds an additional independent axis to consider, an additional dimension. So you see how this model is now getting very, very complicated. But also, as it gets more complicated, it uh, becomes better at explaining human behavior. Now human behavior is not just as simple as slapping on an, a, a label like orange or green or yellow. But now you have to also take into account, well, yes, this person is orange, but also they have a like a a masculine skew of orange. And also they, uh, they've had a mystical state or they haven't had a mystical state. Uh, and those are all independent fa factors and variables. And then if that wasn't enough, now there's the fourth final dimension, which is lines, lines of development. So the human psyche has different facets to it. Mostly when we're talking about spiral dynamic stages, what we're talking about is we're talking about one line called the cognitive development line and also values. What are your values? And that's a very important developmental line, but there's more. For example, you can have a high level of cognitive development, but a low level of emotional development or moral development. So let me give you these various lines. These are the most important ones. Cognitive and values, which we've talked about a lot. Then the emotional line, the moral line, career and livelihood, health and nutrition and diet, interpersonal relationships, the metaphysical and spiritual line, your education, your political development, your psychosexual development, and kinesthetic development. So if you think of yourself as like an RPG character in a video game, you know, uh, these RPG characters, they have different things that you can put points into. So it's kind of like that. So for example, you can be at a stage orange cognitive development, but your moral development can be a stage red, which means that you're going to be a criminal and you're going to hurt a lot of people because you're at an egocentric level of moral development. And also maybe your interpersonal relationships, the development, you know, how developed are you when you're relating with other people? That can also be very low. Uh, or maybe for some other person, their uh, metaphysical or spiritual development will be very, very high at turquoise, but then their cognitive level of development will only be at orange or blue. And maybe their moral development will also be very, very high Think of someone like a Gandhi or a Mother Teresa who has a rather high moral development, but you know they they might have a a poor development in uh, in politics or in career or in the interpersonal realm. So you can see when we add this additional level of lines, now now the model becomes like four dimensional. Now we have all these independent axes, all these variables to consider. So. If you were trying to peg yourself at some color like orange or green and you weren't quite sure where you fit and you were kind of confused and you were thinking like, well, but Leo, I have certain aspects of myself which are orange, certain aspects which are blue, certain aspects which are green, and yellow. Well, that's right, because the psyche is complex and it has these different facets. So now it helps you to be more specific. It helps to ask the question, if you're trying to evaluate yourself or somebody else, you can ask the question of like, well, let's focus on the moral line. How morally developed is this person? Are they green, orange, or blue? And then whatever that turns out to be, then we can still ask the question, well, how uh, how is their interpersonal development? Green, orange, or blue? And those can be different. And so, of course, if you really want to develop yourself, you sort of want to become a well-rounded human being. Especially certain of these lines are important to increase, otherwise they're gonna be sticking points for you and they're gonna drag you down and they could even ruin your entire life. For example, if you've been if you've been spending a lot of your time increasing your cognitive development and your your health and diet and maybe your interpersonal relationship, but your moral line 
is very, very low and you're not doing any work to increase that, then that could derail your whole life because you might be engaged in some kind of criminal activity that will ultimately get you arrested and thrown into prison. See? Now, this also doesn't mean that you need to be perfect in every line. So don't get too obsessive thinking that, okay, I got to be at stage turquoise on everything across the board. In practice, that's going to be very difficult to do because even raising one of these lines takes a lot of work. Um, uh, but, you know, that's that's why we spend years and years doing this work. And there's so many topics to cover because uh, growing up to be a, a well-rounded and developed human being is a complex affair. And lopsided development is very common. Most people are lopsided. Nobody is the same color across the board on every line. That's very, very rare. Now, these lines that I've talked about, these were lines when you're considering an individual human psyche. But what about when we're applying this model to collective groups like uh, corporations, nations, religions, sports teams, and uh, families? Uh, what are the lines there? There's different lines there as well. For example, if we're considering a country, the lines there might be the economy or the religion or the culture or the media or the food or the politics of the country or the science and technological development level of the country or its medicine system or its education system or the way it does business and marketing or its legal system and its human rights or its law enforcement system, its prison system, its mental health, uh, how family and marriage is viewed within that country or art. So each of these lines can have different levels of development. So a country, for example, can be very highly developed economically, but at a low spiritual level of development, which is rather where America is today. Or vice versa, some, some countries can have a very high level of spiritual development, for example, like India, but then um, their science and technology or their economy isn't very well developed. And so all of those factors are important to take into account. So if you were seriously going to apply spiral dynamics to a complex problem, like you wanted to apply it within business or you wanted to apply it to create public policy, you would really want to break it down into all these individual lines and you would want to be very uh, specific and say, well, you know, if, if I'm trying to reform our legal system, what stage of the spiral is our legal system at in America? And you might say, well, it's rather orange. What would a green legal system look like? What would a yellow legal system look like? And, um, and then you can get a lot of actionable uh, solutions to, to try out there. Let's take a look at an example of how the masculine and feminine and moral developmental line, how these types and these lines uh, actually play out sort of in the real world. So masculine and feminine, remember, is a type. So there's a sort of a masculine set of values and a feminine set of values, which skews whichever color of the stage you're at. So for example, what's the difference between masculine and feminine? It boils down to this essential thing. For the masculine, there's an emphasis on rights, autonomy, individuality, agency, thinking, and freedom. And for the feminine, there's an emphasis on the value of care, connection, compassion, feeling, rather than thinking, relationship, and community. So you see, it's a slightly different emphasis. So most men would lean towards the masculine, most feminine, uh, most w women would lean towards the, the feminine. But of course, you know, this, this changes depending on your hormones and your sexual orientation and so forth and your uh, gender identity. And, um, and so look, this, this, this masculine feminine will play out at different colors of the spiral in different ways. Like what does autonomy look like at stage red versus what does autonomy look like at stage orange or stage yellow for a man? And then what does, for example, compassion 
or relationship mean for a woman at red versus orange versus yellow? You're going to see an evolution of that. And so now let's also look at, at the moral developmental line. So how does this evolve? It basically can be broken down to three simple uh, phases. First, at the most crude level, is you have just a purely selfish orientation towards the world. Then there is a caring orientation towards the world. Then there's what's called universal care. So from selfish to care to universal care. Or we could say it as me, we, or the entire globe. And uh, if we want to break it down even further, even finer, then the way that basically morality develops within human beings is as follows. When you're born, all you basically care about is you. So it's all me, me, me. Then, as you get socialized, you start going to school and you become part of a community. Now, it can't just be all about me. Now, it has to be about us, the family, the tribe, the city, the nation, the team, the corporation. That's a shift in your moral development. Then there's another shift where you realize that it can't just be about us and my tribe. It has to include all decent human beings, which means now I care. My level of care extends to every human being who isn't evil, but not to the evil ones. The evil ones I don't care about. Then there's the next level where you realize, you know what? I got to care about the evil ones too, because they're also part of this uh, human species. They're all part of the community. So now my level of concern expands to all human beings without exception. But then I realized, wait a minute, it can't just be human beings. It has to be all creatures on the entire planet. And so now it expands to all living beings on earth without exception. But then I realized, wait a minute, the earth is just one little speck in this giant cosmos. So now my concern expands to all sentient beings in all places, on all planets, and in all realms. If there's some astral realm where there's some DMT alien, I got to care about him too. Can't exclude him. And then ultimately, when you get to the highest level, to the ultimate non-dual levels, you realize that your care isn't even just limited to sentient beings because the idea of sentience breaks down. And so your care is for all of reality, past, present, and future, in all the ways that it can manifest. You're concerned about it all, and you want the best for all of it rather than just wanting the best for yourself or for your family or for your tribe or for your species or for your race or for the planet Earth. You want the best for everything. And that's sort of God's perspective. If you think about it, you know, God sort of, uh, you might imagine, wants sort of the best for the entire universe. And so you can see, you know, where are you on this level of development, this moral development of the level? Um, and where are you resisting going further? You know, some people get stuck at the, at the level where they, okay, Leo, yeah, I'm willing to care about all human beings on the planet, but, you know, I'm not willing to care about the Hitlers and Stalins and terrorists of the world and the criminals, you know, they, we just got to kill them. Fuck them. I don't care about them. That's where you're at. That's your level of development. And then at some point, if you keep evolving, you will realize that, oh, wait, we have to include them as well. We can't exclude them. Just because they're evil and selfish and kill people doesn't mean that we stop caring for them. And if you're resistant to that, well, that's something that you got to work on. That's what development will correct in you. It will, it will open up your eyes and your perspective such that you realize that you were too limited. Your care was too limited and that you need to expand further. So it's all about expansion, 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 expansion. So uh, as I've been giving you these examples of masculine, feminine, and the moral line of development, um, this helps us to understand a common problem, for example, that we see. Um, you know, some feminists make this problem, is, is they make this mistake of thinking that, well, if we look throughout history, History was so violent, there was so much war, and that was because the men, it was this toxic masculinity that was dominating society. And now finally, now we're getting some equality between the masculine and the feminine. And if society just got more feminine energy, if, if more females ruled 
the world and we're in positions of power, that would solve all of mankind's problems and we would all live in peace and harmony together. Well, that's not true. If you understand the nuances of states, stages, lines, and types. Because what you got to understand is that there's different stages of feminine. So what stage of feminine are you talking about when you're talking about increasing feminine? You need the right stage because if you add a bunch of stage red feminine to a masculine orange society, you're actually going to make it worse, not better. Because feminine can still be cruel. Feminine can still be limited. Feminine can still be racist. Feminine can still be homophobic. Feminine can still be tolerant of slavery. Now, of course, what many feminists mean is they, they mean adding green feminine, stage green feminine. Now, it's true. If you add a bunch of stage green feminine to uh, an orange male dominant society like in the U.S., then that probably will elevate the society and probably will lead to more peace and more compassion. That's true. But that, you know, is that because you're adding mass uh, feminine or is that because you're adding green feminine? That's an important distinction. And uh, because if you understand this distinction, you'll also understand this additional nuance that masculine isn't the enemy per se, because there's different flavors of masculine. Red masculine certainly is a problem. And maybe even orange masculine is a problem, but there's also green masculine. So maybe what we need more of is not just green feminine, but also green masculine. Because the problem is that if you introduce a lot of green feminine, you're going to, sure, maybe you solve some certain problems in society, but then you create new problems. Because now you still have 50% of the population who are masculine, the men, but now these men feel feminized. They don't feel connection with their masculine energy, and now they become dysfunctional and start to misbehave. Which we're seeing with some of these incels and, and men's rights movements and so forth, right? They're reacting against feminine, not realizing that feminine and green aren't necessarily the same thing. There's also a green version of masculine. So that's why these additional nuances can make a big difference. Not as simple as it seems. Here's another very important thing to understand is that these different color stages cannot be seen through introspection when you're sitting on a meditation cushion. They require wide scientific research. You have to go out and actually study lots of groups of individuals across the whole world different cultures, different societies, different races. And you have to compile all the data. And only then do you see this entire developmental model like spiral dynamics unfold. And this, these developmental stages, they were only discovered in the last hundred years. So what this means is that most religious and spiritual traditions around the world which are hundreds or thousands of years old, do not understand the idea of stages or types or lines of development. And most of these spiritual traditions, they were developed by advanced meditators who would sit on a cushion and introspect for many, many hours to attain very high mystical states. But see, mystical states are separate from stages of development. So just because you're at a high mystical state doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to understand and see the entire spiral and all of the possibilities of development that exist. And so one of the biggest problems right now with all the traditional religions, Islam, Hinduism, Christianity, Judaism, and even Buddhism, is that None of these religions basically understand spiral dynamics and they don't account for development very much. Most of them are focused on helping you to attain higher states. If that, and then, you know, a lot of them only focus on just filling your head with dogma, which is, which is even worse because you don't even get the, the mystical states. Um, so 
You got to understand that. And, and this also explains why, you know, those people who say, oh, Leo, but this spiral dynamic stuff, it's all just concepts and models. It's all bullshit. If you just sit and you're just present in the moment, there, there is no spiral. There are no stages. Yes, of course, that's true. Spiral dynamics is a conceptual framework. But, um, but just because that's true doesn't mean that spiral dynamics isn't useful and that you're not missing something. And in fact, you are missing something. If all you do for the rest of your life is you just sit on a cushion and you introspect and you practice mindfulness and you practice meditation and you become fully enlightened, there's still going to be something that you're missing. And you're not going to be fully developed. And you're not going to fully know how to analyze the various problems that are happening in the world socially, collectively, because our social and collective problems mostly have to do not well, some of them have to do with the fact that people aren't awake. Of course they do. But they also have a large component of um, people just lacking in development. Organizations and, and countries and legal systems lacking in development. And that's important. Because our society and our culture contributes enormously to our ability and potential to wake up. So if you want to wake up a lot of people, you can't just teach them techniques for sitting on a cushion and meditating all day. That's great. That's a very direct path. And of course, for some tiny percentage of the population, that will work great. But for the vast majority of the population, it won't work at all because they're not at a level of development where they can even hear you and understand your teachings or even be open-minded to your teachings. Because to assume that a person is open-minded enough to hear non-dual teachings, they already have to be at like stage green or beyond. Otherwise, they'll uh, they'll demonize you and maybe even burn you at the stake. And it would be nice to understand that. So if we really want to wake up the whole world, we got to also take into account development. Enlightenment itself, it's very important to understand, has no stages. Enlightenment is absolute. But how you interpret that enlightenment very much depends what stage you're at and, and how holistic and integrative are you with your understanding of spirituality and all of religion and science and how much do you integrate it all together. That very much depends on your level of development. A stage blue enlightened person can still be racist, sexist, could even potentially own slaves or condone slavery or um, have some sort of crude, archaic political views, for example. Or might be very biased towards his own culture, might be very ethnocentric, might be very biased and partial to his own religious uh, tradition. Like some, you know, some Hindu guru master might just be all about Hinduism, but discount the value of Buddhism or Islam. And there might be some valuable nuggets within Buddhism or Islam that that person is missing. Maybe some valuable techniques, maybe some valuable uh, moral teachings or whatever that would help round out this Hindu master. That's the value of a more holistic, integrative approach. It's also much more enjoyable to see the interconnectedness of everything because that's one thing that consciousness is doing. Because consciousness is one, we're talking about oneness here. Yes, you can awaken to the infinite void, the emptiness, the nothingness. Yes, you, of course you awaken to that. That's, that's, that's critical. But then what you do for the rest of your life is now you're still navigating this dream. You're navigating this infinite uh, creation with all these forms and shapes and all this stuff that's happening. You're navigating it and what you're seeing then, your mind is integrating it all together and you're seeing all the nuanced interconnectedness of everything. You're seeing, for example, how oh, Buddhism is talking about this and Islam is talking about the same thing and, and then Hinduism is also talking about it, but it, it's all being talked about in different ways and then you see the beauty of that and then you see, for example, like Hindu art and Islamic art and Christian art, and you see how all of that fits in together. And so you're seeing more and more of the interconnectedness of everything. And in this way, your awakening becomes richer. 
more holistic, more integrated, and more beautiful. It's also important to understand that spiral dynamics doesn't account for everything. There are factors which are just independent of spiral dynamics. For example, maybe IQ, like you can have a different level of IQ at every stage. That's an independent variable. Or your level of spiritual attunement. People might have a, a natural spiritual talent for spiritual work or for meditation. That would be separate from whatever stage of development they're at. Or maybe karma, that would be a separate factor. Genetics and environment, those can also be separate factors. Early trauma that you might have suffered as a child, maybe you were abused or you were in a near-death situation or you were molested uh, or you have some PTSD, you know, that would be a complicating factor, which is independent of your spiral stage. Maybe you have some kind of physical Ill illness, maybe you have a mental illness and a disability. Um, you know, spiral dynamics doesn't account for things like psychopaths and sociopaths and criminals. It accounts for criminality in some ways, but, but you know, you can still be a criminal pretty much at any stage. Um, it doesn't ac account for racial differences, if there are any, uh, class differences, economic status. You know, these are all further complicating factors. In fact, uh, let me give you an even more elaborate list of various psychological factors and things which are independent of your stage on the spiral. I'll run through the whole list. Uh, it's a pretty big list. I'll run through the whole list real quickly, and then I'll um, I'll expand on certain parts of it. So, judgment. And as I'm saying each one, what this means is that this this word that I'm saying, like judgment, this thing can happen at any stage in the spiral. Because sometimes people think that oh, well, judgment that can only happen at stage blue. And a stage green person can't possibly be judgmental. So if I ever encounter a judgmental person, that immediately places them in the blue category. No, that's wrong. Judgment can happen even at turquoise. Now, of course, a stage red person will be much, much more likely to be judgmental than a stage turquoise person. But judgment can still happen. It's just that judgment looks differently. Judgment evolves through all of these stages. It's very difficult to transcend all judgment entirely. You know, that's very, very rare. So, judgment, hatred, addiction, fear, demonization, projection, radicalization, ideology and dogma is not limited to blue. It can happen all along the spiral. Paradigm lock, duality, justification, distractions, self-bias, ignorance, bad public policy. Do not assume that just because someone is a stage turquoise guru that he can't have some loony, wacky public policy proposals that would be terrible and that would hurt lots of people. That can certainly happen. Emotional reactivity happens at all stages. Getting triggered. Closed-mindedness can even exist at turquoise. Passion. You can be passionate at every stage. You can be a super passionate, super charismatic stage red tyrant, for example. You can be passionate about killing people. Or you can be passionate about loving people. You see? These are independent variables. Lying. You can lie at every stage. Selfishness. There's different forms of selfishness at every stage. Abuse of power. You think stage turquoise gurus can't abuse their power? They certainly can. Fame, you can be famous at any stage. Spirituality happens at every stage. Crime can happen at every stage. You can be a stage turquoise criminal. Now, of course, that's much more li uh, less likely than if you're stage red, but it can still happen. Manipulation. Each stage manipulates in its own way. Hypocrisy. Injustice and inequality. Love. Don't think that only the highest stages can love. All the stages can love. Even a stage red tyrant can still love. And no, I don't mean in the sense that he loves to kill people. I mean, he can, he, you know, a stage red tyrant can genuinely love his daughter or his wife. No problem. 
uh, horniness. You can be horny at every stage. Don't think that a stage turquoise guru doesn't have sexual cravings. Mistakes can happen at every stage. Business and wealth can happen at every stage. People make the silly mistake of thinking that, well, if it's a business, if this is a business person, they must be automatically stage orange because orange is all about business and making money. That's generally true, but you have businesses at every stage of the spiral. They just look different. They have different values. You could have lots of money at every stage of the spiral. You could have lots of money as a red tyrant, lots of money as an orange Wall Street broker, or even lots of money as a stage turquoise guru like Osho with his 90-some <laughs> Rolls Royces. Denial can happen every stage. Gender identity happens at every stage. Playing victim, the victim mentality. Laziness. You can be lazy at high stages. Pathology. Groupthink. Misunderstanding. Miscommunication happens at all stages. Reasoning. Don't think that reason and rationality are limited exclusively to stage orange. Yes, it's generally true that stage orange is the sort of the rational one. But, you know, stage blue people can reason. Even stage purple tribal people in the Amazon and in Africa and in Papua New Guinea, they, they use reason. It's just a different kind of reason used for different purposes. Obesity can happen at every stage. Don't think that just because a person is fat, you see some fat guru and then you think, of, well, a fat guru can't be turquoise because turquoise people, they're supposed to be healthy and fit. No, nobody said that. Those are independent variables. Mental disorders can happen at any um, stage. And self-deception happens at all stages. All st Even the very highest stages, you get self-deception. Um, I have a three-part mini-series called Self-Deception, where I outline like 50 different self-deception mechanisms. All of those self-deception mechanisms can happen at every level of the spiral. Now, of course, the higher up you are, the, the more aware you will be of them, but you're never going to be fully immune from them. All right, so let's take an intermission right here. We've covered a lot of ground, but we still have a lot more to go. All right, let's continue. So the way that I like to think about spiral dynamics and reality as a whole is that there really is no such thing as one reality. What you do is you replace this notion of one reality instead with spiral dynamics, which means that every stage is a new reality. You're sort of living in your own bubble at every stage. And you see all these different facets of life in different ways corresponding to the lens that you're looking through, which is the color of your stage. So what that means is, very practically, is that love is different at each stage. Spirituality is different at each stage. Religion is different at each stage. And that's very important to understand. Let's pause and elaborate on this point about religion. It's very easy to fall into the trap of oversimplifying religion and thinking that religion is just a stage blue activity. It's just fundamentalist dogma and that that's what Christianity is. That's what Islam is. That's even maybe you think that's what Buddhism is and Hinduism. That's not quite right. There are green versions of Christianity, for example. There can be yellow and turquoise versions of Islam. Now, I'm not saying they're common uh, and maybe even they don't really exist yet, but they will in the future and so on with all the other religions, all right? So uh, the mistake that's commonly made when people demonize a particular religion is that it's assumed as though the religion is this one monolithic static thing and that it's never going to evolve or change. And that's just not true. Religion has always evolved. Even very fundamentalist religious people who tend to treat religion as a monolith Still, if you look historically, if you study history, if you study the history of Christianity, Islam, and Buddhism, you know, there's always been evolution and change within all of these traditions. It's inevitable because everything changes and everything evolves. That's just the nature of all form. 
So, uh, you know, in 200, 300 years, I very much foresee that there will be a yellow version of Islam, a green version of Islam, a turquoise version of Islam. It's, it's not like these religions are really going away. They're going to be there. They're going to soften at the edges. They're going to take on a more pluralistic perspective, a most po more relativistic perspective. They're going to become less dogmatic, less ideological, less violent, more compassionate, more loving, having a sense of more universal inclusiveness. And then ultimately, they're going to incorporate mystical and non-dual insights. Now, of course, the mystical and non-dual insights are there right now. If you look at Islam or Judaism or Christianity, non-duality was there from the very, very beginning. That's how they were founded. They were founded by mystics. But there's a difference between the that esoteric core of every religion and sort of the mainstreamed versions of it that are known by just average, ordinary folks. You know, most people who are Muslims in the Middle East do not have any true sense of the mystical, esoteric, non-dual uh, kernels of truth which are contained in Islam. And some of them do. Of course, some of them do. The Sufis and others do. There's very advanced, uh, you know, uh, Muslim practitioners may have this, this insight, but it's very rare. So, uh, again, religion is different at every stage. Business is different at every stage. There's a big difference between business at stage orange, green, yellow, and turquoise. And it's a big mistake to think that, oh, well, Leo, once we get beyond yellow and turquoise into those stages, then uh, well, how do I make my money? Because I can't have a business. Of course you can have a business. It's just a different kind of business. How you view the family is different at every stage. What your notion of a family is. Health and nutrition looks different at every stage. Relationships and marriage look different at every stage. Art is different at every stage. The kind of values and themes that art depicts. If you've studied art history, you can actually trace the evolution of art and the role that art played from the very early stages, you know, tens of thousands of years ago, the, the ancient cave paintings. Uh, those came from stage purple tribes. And then art during the, the Roman times, art that was commissioned by tyrants and dictators and emperors and kings. Uh, and then the art that came from uh, various religious traditions, a lot of European art mm, from 500 to 1,000 years ago was, was all basically almost all religious art, all uh, trying to put forth Christian themes in one form or, other, or another, trying to... Um, glorify Christianity. And then, uh, you know, more modern versions of art and postmodern art and all sorts of uh, crazy forms of, of art that happens today. Avant-garde art is more of a green version of art. And there's even art from the yellow and even turquoise perspectives like the art of uh, Alex Gray, who does these uh, psychedelic, trippy, um, psychic types of paintings. So art looks different. Media looks different. Video games, movies, entertainment. I mean, film is going to eventually evolve. And this will probably take hundreds of years, but eventually film will evolve beyond the stupid, mindless superhero movies that we're stuck in right now, which are very stage orange, into um, more refined, more higher consciousness um, types of entertainment. And so will video games and all the other stuff and virtual reality and all that. Politics, of course, is very different at every stage. Motivation. What motivates you or what motivates your nation or your culture or your team or your group of people? That very much changes state to state. Your fears and worries are different for every stage. Criticism and analysis is different depending on which stage it's coming from. And reason and justifications are different from each stage. What you consider good, bad, destructive, healthy, unhealthy, dangerous, or crazy is relative to your stage. These words do not have an absolute definition. 
what's good at stage blue looks bad at stage orange and vice versa. What's healthy to green is unhealthy to yellow. What's crazy to stage blue is the opposite for stage green and so forth. A lot of people don't understand this and then they get confused because they look at a thing and it looks so evil or bad or destructive or unhealthy or dangerous or crazy, but that's from their perspective. Um, and actually the funny thing is, is that some of the healthiest and some of the, um, the highest things that you can achieve as a human being, ironically look very unhealthy and destructive and dangerous and crazy to people who are at lower levels of development, which is a huge problem because if we want to help to elevate and to evolve all of society, that's difficult to do when half the population or even more is, is at a low level of development and therefore they see all the good stuff and all the healthy stuff as actually being unhealthy and crazy and that it's going to destroy the world. How do you convince them then to, um, to make these changes that we need? You can't because they, they demonize those changes and they're afraid of them. And then a lot of people can't understand that. Every stage looks dangerous, crazy, criminal, insane, or evil, or diluted to some other stage on the spiral. That's not because things actually are that way. It's just because of the lens that you're looking through. And in fact, I want to spend some time going to some detail to elaborate on how each stage looks at every other stage. So let's start with blue. How does blue see red? as selfish and uncivilized beasts. How does blue see blue? As a lesser civilization. Blue doesn't get along with blue. So for example, when evangelicals look at stage blue uh, Muslims in the Middle East, uh, they view them as inferior because that's the blue position. The blue position is that I am a civilization, but I am the best civilization. And yes, there are other blue civilizations out there. I don't, of course, really know that they're blue because I don't even know about the spiral, but they're all lesser than me because that's what ethnocentrism is. How does blue view orange? As too materialistic, too secular, and too liberal. So, for example, how do Middle Eastern Islamic clerics look at uh, American stage orange capitalism, they view it as hedonism. They view it as a descent into depravity and materialism, all this porn and, and women dressing in scantily clad dresses and all this makeup and showing their legs and wearing skirts and all of this. And then, you know, what are Americans obsessed with money and cars? They're forgetting the thing that actually is supposed to be grounding you in life which is God, which is Islam. See, that's how it looks to them. And of course, many blue evangelicals in America, or like maybe Mormons, uh, when they look at stage orange Americans, they will also see them this way, as too secular, too liberal, too materialistic. They've lost touch with their Christianity, with their Mormon roots or whatever, um, with their faith and with the family values and with tradition and with with heritage and family and with the, uh, you know, with their children, they, they've lost connection with all of this. And now they uh, just uh, basically are just uh, chasing material success. And of course, that's why they're depressed and miserable and uh, they're hopped up on drugs and all of this. And that's why civilization is collapsing and all the rap music and all of this, right? It's this classic, classic uh, uh, example of how blue views orange. How does blue view green? As relativists, nihilists, libertines, bohemians, communists, and hippies. So if you want a really good example of how blue views green, uh, a lot of Jordan Peterson's critiques of postmodernism and socialism and communism is coming from this perspective. 
That doesn't mean that he's purely blue, but a lot of his critiques are coming from this perspective. How does blue view yellow? As space cadets, elites, and intellectuals. And uh, lost in the, in the clouds, philosophers. How does blue view turquoise? As arrogant heretics and nutcases. So for example, how would a blue uh, fundamentalist Muslim cleric view a non-dual mystic. Uh, he would view him as an arrogant heretic because the mystic says, I am God, we are all God. But the stage blue uh, fundamentalist says, no, we can't all be God. God is beyond all humans. There's that fundamental duality. And you can't be the same as Jesus, you can't be the same as Muhammad, you can't be at that same level as the Buddha. Those were all uh, prophets, and nobody is, is at the same level as one of these prophets. That's just because they haven't gotten there yet. They're, they're holding that as a dogma. All right, so how does stage orange view all the other stages? Orange views red as dangerous criminals, blue as deluded religious fanatics uh, who... Uh, won't listen to reason. How does you view orange itself? As competition. As competition. How does view uh, orange view green? As naive idealists, hippies, snowflakes, social justice warriors, bleeding heart liberals, soy boys, and as being too feminine, too soft. How does orange view yellow? as impractical philosophers, theoreticians, and a source of ideas to exploit. And how does Orange view turquoise? As New Agers, as frauds and religious nutcases. Orange confuses turquoise mystics and sages with stage blue deluded religious fundamentalists. Puts them in the same category. Or maybe lumps them in with, uh, with hippies. But generally, when an orange person sees a stage turquoise guru talking about some spiritual topic, he's going to tend to think of that turquoise person as a, as a fraud or as a huckster trying to like pretend to be a guru just to earn money. Really, that's just a projection of orange because orange is all about earning money and materialism. So he thinks that these sages and mystics, that that's all they care about too. Uh, how does stage green view the other stages? Green views red as, very interestingly, victims of social abuse. So green tends to have a certain kind of overextended compassion for red, which is why red can often abuse and exploit green. Because green is that sort of very compassionate, overly compassionate, sometimes bleeding heart liberal uh, I remember uh, there was a story that I read in the news maybe a year or so ago where there were some sort of like people from California, some liberal types who wanted to go to, to the Middle East, to Afghanistan, to like ISIS and confront ISIS and like present them with flowers and with gifts and all of this, thinking that they would be able to convince a stage red, um, you know, Islamic fundamentalist. Uh, who is going to chop their head off, that they could convince them with compassion, with love. No, that's not going to work. They're going to chop your head off. You got to understand that. It's green. Got to be careful. Uh, how does green view blue? As heartless medieval fundamentalists who lack compassion. Fundamentally, they lack compassion. How does green view orange? as used car salesmen and greedy capitalists who are exploiting people. How does green view other green? As comrades, fellow comrades to build a network for social justice with. How does green view yellow? As aloof elitists and intellectuals. From the green perspective, yellow is, is way too much stuck in their head and not enough uh, compassion. And also, not enough community and relationship because yellow is more individualistic and green is, is a little bit more conformist. 
how does green view turquoise? Very interestingly, green tends to look at turquoise as already what green is doing. So when a green sees some turquoise guru, uh, they will say, well, that's green. I am, uh, I mean, what I am is turquoise. That's how green tricks itself, is green thinks it's turquoise, which is uh, too high of an evaluation. And also green tends to worship these turquoise gurus. And that's sort of what happened with the Osho phenomenon is you had a lot of uh, Westerners and Californians and Americans who were uh, really inspired by Osho and became his followers, but they weren't nearly as advanced as Osho. They were green, the hippies, and Osho was turquoise. And so that can create a sort of an interesting and dysfunctional dynamic, as it did there. What about yellow? How does yellow view red? As dangerous narcissists, how does it view blue? As closed-minded bigots and moralists. Yellow views orange as myopic rationalists and sleazy businessmen and people who are trapped in the rat race and can't see beyond it. Yellow sees green as naive emotional do-gooders. How does yellow see yellow? As competent experts. Yellow values the expertise and the intelligence of yellow. And how does yellow view turquoise? As wise masters, as sort of the, uh, the example of what mankind can aspire to. So another point I want to make here is that confirmation bias works on every stage. And uh, what this means is that whatever stage you're at, you will pick out the facts that support and validate the correctness of your stage while, ignore, while ignoring every other set of facts. So for example, if you're at stage blue in America, then you will think that Muslims are taking over the world and they are the greatest threat. And using confirmation bias, your mind will cherry pick all the facts in order to support that narrative. You will read the newspapers you need to read, look at the news that you need to, uh, to look at, and talk to the people you need to talk to in order to only see the facts of how Muslims are going to take over the world and destroy everything if they do. And you're not going to see all the contrary evidence. You're not going to see how Muslims are helping the world. You're not going to see the value in Islam. You're not going to bother to study that. You're not going to bother to learn what the Sufis have in common with the Christian mystics. You're not going to bother to, to consider the possibility that there's no difference between Allah and your Christian God, and that they're actually one and the same God. right? So none of these things are going to be important to you, even though they're factually true, but all of this your mind is going to discount using confirmation bias, just to reinforce that narrative. Because from a stage blue perspective, you have certain fears and worries that need to be validated. And they will look very real to you, and you will buy into them, and you will really believe that Muslims are the problem. And that if, if we don't put a lid on that, that it's going to lead to the destruction of the whole world. And if you're at stage orange, you're going to believe that socialists are going to ruin everything. Socialism is going to destroy the world. And you're going to look for all the facts and supporting evidence to confirm that. And it's really going to look like to you, from your orange perspective, that look, yeah, Leo, but it's true. Look at all this. This wave of socialism is sweeping across America. And look at all these socialists and communists and all of this. And look at all the stuff that's happening in the universities and all this postmodernism and all this. So this whole Jordan Peterson spiel. So you're going to really believe in that narrative. And it's going to really look like to you that if you let these socialists do what they want to do, they're going to destroy the whole world. Because those are your fears. And you don't bother actually reading about socialism. You don't bother about actually considering what are these socialists trying to do? How are they trying to change society for the better? You don't bother considering, for example, that um, FDR and many of the things that came with the New Deal, like Social Security and Medicare and all of this, 
that these are actually socialist policies. You don't bother thinking about all the elements within current American society, which are examples of socialism, various forms of socialized medicine and, and um, various ways in which our military is socialistic, um, uh, various government programs that we have which are effective and work well, how we build our roads, our firefighters, our police, how this is really just a form of socialism, how basically all of society is a form of socialism. So all of these things are lost on you because you just want to reinforce that stage orange narrative. And of course, you're not going to bother looking at other socialist countries around the world that are positive examples for socialism. You're going to only cherry pick the bad examples. You're going to talk about Venezuela and um, Maoist China and uh, Soviet, the, you know, the collapse of the Soviet Union and Cuba and Fidel Castro. You're going to talk about this. You're not going to talk about the successes that have been happening, for example, in the uh, Nordic Scandinavian countries and elsewhere, uh, other experiments with socialism that has worked out well in various countries. You're not going to think about that. You're not going to think about the fact that most first world countries in the world have various forms of universal health care. You're not going to really think about that because that doesn't reinforce your narrative. And if you're at stage green, you're going to think that global warming and capitalism is killing us all. It's all of the pollution that's uh, that's going to destroy the environment. It's the polar bears and the, the dying of the corals and the 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 felling of the forests and the, the burning of the jungle and the rainforest in, in Brazil and in the Amazon and all of this destruction, all these species are dying. So you're going to, you're going to gather all of these facts, which of course they're true. All of this stuff is happening, but from the green perspective, you're going to over-focus on that and you're going to ignore a lot of the good stuff that's happening. For example, you're going to ignore um, the, uh, you know, the rise of green energy and solar technologies, which are being adopted quite rapidly how solar panels have been lowering in cost significantly over the last 10, 20 years and are continuing to do so. And the rise of electric cars and other technologies that are being developed, which are will help us to deal with global warming and various other kinds of um, environmental challenges in the future. So that's your confirmation bias. And if you're at stage yellow, you basically will believe that, no, no, it's not that stuff that's going to kill us all. It's all of tier one. It's the tier one of the spiral that's going to kill us all. It's because stage blue, orange, and green all hate each other and don't understand each other and can't get along, and nobody understands spiral dynamics because it's so complicated and no one knows about it. That's why we're all going to kill each other. So we got to find solutions for that. Now, of course, there's some truth to that perspective, but uh, you're going to take a little bit overboard. And then at stage turquoise, you just are going to look at the world and you're going to say, it's perfect. Everything is perfect. Everything is going according to plan. It's inevitable. It's exactly how it's going to be. Um, all problems that we have will basically solve themselves. And then you will find the, the facts to confirm that perspective. So that's confirmation bias for you. Confirmation bias is not limited to any one stage. And that is, by the way, one of the uh, self-deception mechanisms that I was talking about earlier. So uh, as I've said already, all tier one stages basically hate each other, which means that stage blue hates green, green hates orange and blue, orange hates blue and green. So there's a lot of hatred to go around. People love to hate. Why is this? Well, because at low levels of development, the lower you are on the spiral, the more hatred will be in you. The more fear, the more bigotry, the more arrogance, the more selfishness, the more closed-mindedness, the more demonization, the more manipulation, the more projection, and the more emotional reactivity. Which is why it's a very good idea to get as much of the global population to evolve and develop up the spiral as quickly as possible because these forces that I just listed, especially he uh, fear, hatred, bigotry, and um, closed-mindedness and various kinds of emotional reactivity, this is the source of uh, much suffering and violence that's going on around the world. And that could lead to, you know, um, massive destruction and death. Uh, so, so the benefits of 
having a high level of development is that you transcend fear and hatred and bigotry and closed-mindedness. And that produces for an objectively better society. Society functions smoother that way. There's less violence. There's less political turmoil, less revolutions and bloody coups, um, less economic turmoil, less market crashes, less inequality, less poverty, less people going hungry, better medical care, and so forth. And overall, that's good for everybody. So that's where society is going to evolve to. But it's not going to be a straight linear path. There's going to be ups and downs because there are vested interests. And so those people who already are doing good under the current system, they're going to have a vested interest in maintaining their current stage. Because otherwise you might wonder, well, Leo, why isn't everybody on board for evolving as quickly as possible to the highest levels of our potential? <laughs> well, um, that's a very naive view, you see, because every stage believes it's the best. And so people get stuck at that stage thinking that we've got it all figured out at this stage. And if only we can get more blue or more orange or more green, we would solve all the world's problems. And that ends up being a delusion. And so because of this delusion and ignorance and ignorance of this entire model, um, a, a lack of nuance in seeing that every stage has its uh, healthy aspects and unhealthy aspects and has serious limitations that need to be ultimately transcended, it's because that's not recognized that we get stuck and we're not moving ahead at um, as fast a pace as we could. Remember, if you're still judging any of the stages below you, you have not fully integrated that stage. You're still missing something that you need to go back and relearn. Here's a couple of um, really good uh, insights that you can get from the spiral dynamics model about humanity and people. I mean, and there's, there's many of these, but I'll just give you three right now, which, um, which will help you understand mankind. Firstly, is that stages below green basically just don't care about the environment. So if you wonder, why don't more people care about global warming? How do we solve the problem of global warming? Well, the reason we can't solve this problem right now, it's... Uh, it's because most people in the world are at stage blue or orange. And blue and orange just doesn't really care about the environment. It doesn't have global concerns. It cares about maintaining the status quo. It cares about continuing to earn profits. It just cares about carrying out its religious uh, dictates and mandates. Stage blue doesn't care about the environment. So, of course, they deny global warming. It's not a concern for them. Global warming is an issue really only for green and above. Ecological concerns. The ability to think ecologically only emerges at green. People below green do not think ecologically. So they don't take ecological problems seriously. They dismiss them until it becomes too late. So another uh, interesting insight is that stages blue and orange will not appreciate and understand psychedelics. So you might have this naive idea that, well, Leo, if we just give the whole world psychedelics in this sort of hippie ideal of like, let's just like lace all the drinking water with LSD and then we'll wake the whole world up. Well, if you understand spiral dynamics, you'll understand that this won't work because psychedelics uh, only start to become valuable to you at around stage green. If you give psychedelics to a stage blue or orange person, I mean, there's a small chance that you could open their mind. Uh, but more likely what will happen is actually they will freak out and they will retreat because the psychedelic will blow their mind so much it will destroy and just utterly shatter their blue and orange paradigms. It'll destroy their fundamentalist religious dogmas, and it'll contradict the materialist paradigm so much that the person will actually think that they're having a psychotic uh, episode and that they're going crazy. 
And so um, they're not going to be able to receive that wisdom that the psychedelic offers. Only stage green people and above. See, so if you want people to to be able to benefit from psychedelics, first you got to raise them to stage green, then you got to distribute the psychedelics. Um, and the third insight is that stages below green will not appreciate non-dual or mystical teachings. So if you're a teacher of non-duality or very advanced truths, you got to understand that um, your audience is going to be stage green and above which limits your audience significantly. And also, you know, if you're trying to teach your friends, if you have some orange or blue friends or family members, and you're trying to teach them about enlightenment or something like that, and they're not understanding you, and they're not interested in it, and in fact, they're demonizing you for it, well, now you understand why. First, you got to get them up to stage green, and then maybe they'll be able to be able to appreciate that. Okay. So this model is very useful and very practical, I want you to see. A common question I get asked about this model is, Leo, is it possible to move backwards or downwards, down the spiral? Is it possible to go from stage orange to blue? And the answer is that generally speaking, not. But uh, that's understanding that uh, you're solidly at orange. So if you're solidly in a stage, you're not likely to regress downwards. Unless there's a temporary regression due to some kind of threat that you receive from your environment. So it certainly is possible to drop a stage temporarily. Like if your average stage is around orange and then something happens to you where you're threatened, your life is threatened, you get angry, you get very fearful, your negative or your lower your lower base emotions get activated, you certainly can drop down to a blue for a while, maybe for a few days, maybe for a week, for a month, for a year. Uh, but then once that's resolved, the threat goes away, then you'll generally kind of go back to where you were before. Um, and um, and I think that under, under conditions of extreme threat, there, there might be a... a a possibility for regression. So for example, if we had a nuclear apocalypse and resources were very scarce, I can see in that situation that a large chunk of the population could regress by one or two stages. Or for example, if you're sent to prison and you're forced to survive in a prison, which is sort of a, uh, you know, maximum security prison would be a stage red environment. If you're at stage green and you have to survive in a stage red environment, well, you're probably going to drop a stage or two just in order to survive. Or maybe you have some sort of physical deterioration, a deterioration of your mind, your brain, uh, some physical ailment or disability, that might drop you down a stage or two. Maybe if you join a cult, that might drop you down a stage or two as they brainwash you and um, fill your mind with all sorts of uh, low consciousness nonsense. Um, maybe if you lose your job temporarily, you know, you're really struggling to, to make ends meet and struggling to feed your children. And that's really stressful for you. You know, during that time, you might drop down a stage and do things that you normally wouldn't do. Maybe you would even engage in some criminal activity just to survive that you normally wouldn't do. Another point is that you cannot see more than one or two stages ahead which means that if you're at stage orange right now, you can preview stage green and even a little bit of yellow, but turquoise, you won't be able to understand. That's a very valuable insight. That means that for most people in the world, because they are at stage orange or even below, they cannot even glimpse or see the deepest and highest teachings that the best human beings have offered. Can't see it. Completely blind to it. You could, you could show them a video, you could give them a book that's a turquoise book, and they will not be able to understand it unless they're roughly at stage green or above. And what this also means is that the best teacher 
to help you to grow as a human being is roughly one to two stages higher than you. Because if the teacher is three stages above you, you probably won't be able to resonate with the teacher or even to believe what the teacher is telling you. You'll think the teacher is a fraud or a charlatan or um, you just you you won't be able to apply what they teach you. But if it's one or two stages above you, then it kind of stretches your, your imagination, but not so much that it kind of shatters your entire reality. It's still basically at that kind of level where, you know, you can stretch to it and get it. Which is, which is a trick. It's a problem. Because, for example, as actualize.org grows, as I grow, my teachings become more advanced. But then the problem is that many of you who follow me, who aren't doing the practices, who are still at stage orange or below, I'm going to lose you. You're going to think I've completely gone batshit crazy talking about all sorts of stuff like oneness and, and God and all the spiritual stuff that I talk about. You'll think I've gone crazy. You'll think I'm a charlatan. You'll think I'm just trying to like use you for the money and I'm just making this shit up. That's how it'll seem to you. And that's sort of inevitable. That's why you should start doing the practices so that you're growing along with me. Also, it's important to understand that you cannot get to higher stages through logic. So it's not a matter of sitting down and logicking your way out of orange into green. Because every stage is like a new paradigm shift. It's unforeseen. So if you want to get from orange to green, that's not going to happen through logic. That's going to happen through opening your heart. And then if you want to get from green to yellow, that's going to happen through some other new unforeseen paradigm shift. Not necessarily more opening of the heart and not necessarily more logic, but something else, something new. That's why it's difficult to grow because it requires some new thing that you haven't seen before. It's like a discovery. It's like discovering a new mathematical truth or a new scientific theory. That's tricky. Requires a new sort of insight. Something has to click in you. I like to break down every stage into four phases. So the way that it works is that, let's say you're at stage orange and you're solidly in stage orange. There's gonna be four phases for how you move into green. First, there's the pre-entry phase, which is where you don't take green seriously. You don't believe that green has any worth or value at all. And in fact, you will judge and demonize and ridicule green because you're still arrogant and you think orange is the best. Then what happens is that finally you open your mind to the value of green and you start to enter it. This is the entry phase. This is phase two. At this point, it feels like you've discovered a new world. It feels fresh and new. You're energized. It's like you've discovered uh, this whole new domain of self-help and green books and healthy eating and yoga and spirit, a little bit of spirituality. Maybe you've tried a psychedelic or you smoke some weed and it's like, that's, you know, that's opened a whole new world for you. And you're like, wow, this is amazing. And at this point, you get really charged up and you're growing very quickly at this entry point. You're kind of going up the curve. And maybe you want to go to your friends and tell your friends, like, hey guys, look at all this amazing stuff here. Read this green book. Come smoke some weed with me. Come do this thing. Come come to this yoga class with me. But then they look at you and they're like, what are you, what are you talking about, dude? This is, this is ridiculous. This is some new age nonsense. You've joined some kind of cult. And of course, they think that way because they're at the pre-entry phase in orange. Your friends were orange. And so they're judging and demonizing and ridiculing, and they think that all this green stuff that you're talking about, it's all worthless. It's all nonsense. Um, but you're already a true believer, so you've entered it. Then comes the third, the third phase, which is now you're solidly in green, and it feels rather familiar to you. Because you've already read a bunch of books, you've already gone to yoga classes, you're starting to get some, some solid experience with having green friends, you've upgraded your friends. Um, and now you're developing expertise in this thing. But there's still a lot of growth for you here. So you're sort of now starting to get to the plateau. And then comes the final fourth 
phase, which is the end. This is the point at which now you've been green for so long, maybe for five or 10 years, you have a bunch of hippie friends and you've smoked a bunch of weed and you've done a bunch of psychedelics. And now it's all starting to feel a little bit stale. You're starting to get frustrated with it. You're starting to see the limitations. You look at your green friends and you see like, ah, uh, their spirituality is kind of flaky. Yeah, they pretend to be spiritual, but they, they can't really embody it. Um, and you start to see the limitations of green. And it's at this point that now you look forward to something new. And it's usually at this green or at this final fourth phase where you are stagnating. You might get lazy. You might feel like you're in a rut. You might feel stuck. And then you're waiting for something new to pop on your radar screen, some new video, some new book, some new teaching, some new seminar, somebody, some guru to come and, and to, to offer you some new gateway that opens up to the next stage, which would be yellow. And then, of course, you're going to have to surrender your judgments and demonizations and ridicule of yellow. And you're going to have to admit that green was not the end-all be-all. And so you're going to have to bite that bullet. That's going to be a little bit of pain for your ego. Uh, that's going to humble you because you were so arrogant before. When you were solidly in green, you thought green was the, the best that there is. But then you realize, no, there's more. And so that's how every stage basically works. I just use the example here of the orange to green transition, but every stage has these different phases. So, so use that idea and, and kind of see where you're at right now. Where are you? What stage are you at? And what phase of the stage are you at? The beginning, the middle, the end. And that kind of tells you what you need to do next. It helps you orient yourself. Remember that you don't want to take shortcuts with working through these stages. So even though I might speak as though uh, the best thing is for everybody to evolve quickly up the spiral, I mean, that's generally the case, but you also don't want to rush yourself. There's a lot of material and lessons to be learned from each stage. These stages are deep. There's a lot to learn even within red, blue, orange, and green. So don't look down at a stage and say, oh, that's too, that's too low. I don't want to be there. I got to quickly move out of it. Uh, make sure you give yourself time. Keep going back to stages and ask yourself, what have I failed to embody from this stage? What have I failed to embody from blue or from red? Keep asking yourself, what healthy function does this stage serve that I haven't integrated and embodied yet? Make sure you solidify yourself in each color before you rush off to the next. Try to exhaust the stage. Become so full of it that you get sick of it. For example, if, if right now you're struggling to make a, a living, you're struggling with your business, maybe spend the next five years just like working really hard on your business, fixing your finances, making a good living until you're just sick of it. You're sick of all the materialism. You've bought your house. You've bought your car. You've gone to parties and you've done all the materialistic stuff and now you're just sick of it. And now you're ready to move on to green. Now you're ready to work on your relationships. You're ready to work on your spirituality. Now you're more interested in meditation, all this. Because if if you try to jump to meditation and to, and to spirituality too quickly without a solid orange foundation, uh, well, you're going to feel it. You're going to feel it. And it's going to be difficult for you because in a certain sense, you do have to kind of have a sort of uh, a level of priorities, a hierarchy, Maslow's hierarchy, of filling these these various needs you know it's hard to it's hard to do the higher level stuff when you don't have a basic shelter when you can't pay your mortgage when your kids are hungry and they're crying you gotta fix that stuff and that's what most of the world right now is still working on most of the world is still at a point where they're stage blue and lower and they just have very basic needs like they need they need medical medical care they need food they need a decent economic system. They need a de decent legal system. They need decent roads and infrastructure, a decent electrical grid, uh, water, clean water, um, various medicine from malaria and other things like that. I mean, these are uh, just super basic issues that many third world countries need to solve before they can really help to introduce people to content like that of actualize.org. Now, of course, don't turn this into a limiting belief. If you're somewhere in a third world country, I mean, 
Try to stretch yourself, push yourself. You're watching these videos. I mean, you've got a great opportunity to use this material to, to sort of um, uh, really rise above the center of gravity of your culture. But of course, it will be more challenging for you. So keep that in mind. You're going to have to work a little bit harder in a third world country than in a first world country just because you don't have the infrastructure and because your culture is not conducive to self-actualization. Because self-actualization is really a stage yellow and above activity. How do you fully integrate a stage? Here's a simple approach. First, you find a healthy role model from that stage. And I do emphasize the word healthy. A healthy role model. Because it certainly is possible to find many unhealthy role models. So find a healthy role model and then study their work, study how they think, study their system of values and their principles that guide their life, and then emulate them, emulate how they think, model them, satisfy those needs that they're trying to satisfy, and make sure that you don't get stuck and then move on to the next stage. What are the best techniques for moving up stages quickly? I would say that without the following techniques, it will take the average person 10 or 20 years just to move up one stage. Moving up the spiral is something that very few people really do, especially when it, we're talking about going beyond the center of gravity of your culture whatever that happens to be. So here are the, the techniques. These are super powerful techniques. Firstly, meditation. Meditation is one of the most well-documented and proven, scientifically proven methods for moving people up the spiral. In fact, they found, they've done research on this, and what they found with meditation is that people who meditate regularly will move up by two stages within several years of meditation, of regular meditation. That's how powerful meditation is. That's why I say that meditation is one of the most important personal development habits. Have you started that habit yet? What are you waiting for? That's the fastest way to move up the spiral. It's guaranteed to work if you meditate earnestly and consistently. Also, mindfulness practice, which you could consider is similar to meditation or even the same as meditation, but also there are some differences. So mindfulness practice also helps a lot. Psychedelics, in my experience, is the most powerful tool for moving up stages. If you do psychedelics consistently, regularly over the course of a couple of years, you will jump up by two stages. I can almost guarantee it. Uh, you know, I've been doing psychedelics for about two years and that's, I mean, uh, psychedelics have, have solidly put me into turquoise where before it was inconceivable. Um, before I was at yellow, the psychedelics have solidly put me into turquoise and have really helped me to overcome various orange fixations that I had. I still had a lot of materialistic orange fixations, even though a lot of my Theoretical content, my videos, have been yellow for a long time. Uh, I've always thought from a yellow perspective, even when I was a teenager. But a lot of my basic needs were still quite orange, quite materialistic and success-oriented. Um, and you can see that in my older videos from five years ago when I first started Actualize.org. You can see a lot of those motivations within me coming through in my in my videos. But after doing psychedelics for a few years, yeah, like I'm, I'm like super solidly yellow and now I'm starting to go into turquoise quite a lot. Uh, meditative yoga is also a very powerful techniques for this. Contemplation, another one. Journaling, another one. Reading. That's why I emphasize reading so much because what does reading do? Reading opens you up to new perspectives, especially when you're reading material from stages that are higher than you. So one of the mistakes people make with reading is that they only read books from their own stage. For example, a stage orange person will read a lot of business and financial books. 
nothing wrong with that. That's great. That's important for for fully uh, integrating your own stage. But but really, to to outgrow that, you need to start to read green books and yellow books and turquoise books. And that will grow you a lot. Because by reading these books, you're exposed to new ideas. And by the time you're exposed to all these new ideas and new perspectives, you can't deny them after a certain number of years. You know, so much exposure just makes it impossible to deny. And then your mind knows that you got to be heading for these higher stages and not to get stuck in orange or whatever stage you're stuck in. Another very powerful technique is having higher consciousness friends or rather, I guess, higher stage friends. So um, a very sure way to grow into a new stage is to surround yourself with friends from a higher stage than you. So if you're orange right now, surround yourself with a bunch of hippies. You will become a hippie very quickly if you do that, as long as you can stomach it. Um, of course, none of this is going to be easy. All these techniques require lots of struggle, lots of opening your mind, lots of there's going to be lots of resistance from your ego. So it's not going to be easy, um, but it will work. You know, and if if you want to get to yellow, surround yourself with a bunch of yellow people and a bunch of turquoise people. Join a yellow community. Join a turquoise community. Now, of course. The higher you go up the spiral, the harder it is to find these people because they're rarer and rarer and rarer. Um, but still, if you're really motivated, you can do it. The other technique is solo retreats. This is a very powerful technique. I've uh, posted videos on my blog about how I do my solo retreats. Basically, 10 days alone in the woods in a cabin somewhere. Um, sitting there and meditating and just being by yourself or contemplating the entire 10 days straight. Very powerful. If you do a few of those per year, maybe one per quarter, ideally, but even just like two per year, uh, for a few years, that will definitely boost you up by a stage or two. Workshops and seminars are also available that you can, you can find workshops and seminars that are stage orange, green, yellow, and turquoise. And all of those will move you up as long as they're higher than you. And then I think also travel. Travel and exposing yourself to new cultures, new cuisines, especially not the kind of touristy travel where you kind of just go and uh, you go on a tour bus and you just see the kind of standard stuff that people see. But I mean, actually really exposing yourself to a different culture, a very foreign culture, like maybe if you grew up in the in America your whole life, and then you go and you spend a month or two living in the Middle East or in Africa or somewhere in Thailand or, in, you know, in Indonesia, uh, this kind of stuff. Like, I think that will grow you by a stage or two because what that does is that expands your perspective and that shows you just how limited your old perspective used to be. So, in conclusion... I want to make sure I reiterate that there is only one thing in the entire universe, and that is being or consciousness. There are not actually stages to being or consciousness. Stages are a conceptualization. They are relative because all form, all creation is relative. The absolute consciousness or being, the, the substance of which everything is made, that is just one thing. But then the structures that happen within it, those are relative structures. And that's what Spiral Dynamics talks about. Right? So um, there's really no contradiction between Spiral Dynamics and non-duality or enlightenment. There's value to having relative truths. And so spiral dynamics is a relative truth. It's not an absolute truth. So when you're, when you're in a state of nirvana, will there be spiral dynamics there? No, there won't. In a state of nirvana, there's, you're, you're way beyond spiral dynamics. But you're not going to be stuck in a state of nirvana forever. You're going to come back down, and then you have to interact in the relative world. And that's where spiral dynamics becomes very useful. And you're still going to be part of society. You're going to be part of a culture. You're going to be part of a country. And so you probably want to improve your environment, improve your society, and help raise the consciousness of people. And in that sense, 
Spiral Dynamics is very useful to be able to do that and to analyze all of these social problems that we have. And finally, remember that pathology is possible at every stage. It's possible to screw up in the way that you are executing these stages such that you don't grow through it and fully integrate it, but that there are some sort of hangups. There are certain things, parts of the stage that you repress or that you deny or that your ego reacts against, and therefore you become pathological at that stage. So watch out for that. There are many, many traps on this path, many ways that you can misinterpret a stage, misapply this model, um, not fully integrate the lessons of every stage. So, uh, you know, the devil is in the details. But as far as an overall picture, I think now you have a much better sense of how spiral dynamics works and how to apply it and um, get a lot more use out of it than you did before. All right, that's it. I'm done here. Please remember to click that like button for me and come check out actualize.org. That's my website. You'll be able to find uh, resources there to help you with your journey. My blog, the forum, the life purpose course, and the book list. And then uh, I will be making more resources available in the future. And I'm always posting new insights on my blog, which are not available anywhere else. And you won't get those through videos here on YouTube. So uh, that's that. The last thing I'll say is, is that we're still not done with Spiral Dynamics. You might think that we've uh, beaten this horse to death, but no, there's still going to be one more episode that I intend to shoot about Spiral Dynamics application. All the ways in which Spiral Dynamics can be applied to all the problems within society. There's so much to be said about that, and it's so profound, and it's going to be so inspirational when you watch that that um, make sure you stick around for that. That's going to be coming in the future. And also, at some point, I will go back and I will create uh, one more episode for Stage Red, which I haven't covered yet, and one more episode for Stage Purple, which I haven't covered yet. Those are sort of primitive stages, but there's still value in understanding those, and there's still lessons that you can, uh, you can glean from that. So that will be coming in the future, although those two aren't uh, nearly as high priority for me as the applications episode. I'm really excited about the applications episode. I actually wanted to include it here, but this one is going to be so long that, um, well, I didn't want this to be three hours long. So there you go. Stay tuned, and uh, that will come in the future.